Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dave Valenthic. I'm here today with Hillary Hunter, and we're going to talk about the insides of AI and how it's working for enterprises out there, which is extremely important to me because I'll tell you what, everybody's trying to figure it out. I mean, I've been in this business, Hillary, for 30 some odd years since the late 80s as a list programmer, and then suddenly uh, AI was a tiger by the tail. Uh, so you're becoming kind of AI aware and looking at the marketplace. It just took off in all kinds of crazy directions now. Enterprises are trying to figure out what to do. I think yep. the technology preventers are trying to figure out how to provide it. And what I'm seeing now is interesting. I'm seeing kind of a stagnation as the enterprises are looking at the technology providers. The technology providers have done a lot of investment in the system. They're trying to find the right use cases for it. They're trying to figure out how to hire the people that they need to build it. Yeah. And there's just a ton of confusion. I, I just got off a call for two hours talking to CIOs who were confused about generative AI, trying to explain to them how to think about this stuff and how to leverage it as something that's going to basically bring their business to the next level. You have to remember that if we leverage AI effectively, we're able to create a unique, innovative differentiator for some of these businesses where we are able to take a pharmaceutical business or a bank or, or a uh, car business to the next level by leveraging AI as something that's going to become something that provides them with a unique perspective, unique competitive advantage that their competitors don't have. And that's what's at stake here, which is very different than the movement to cloud, the movement to service Absolutely. oriented architecture, you know, all these things had in the past. So what are you guys experiencing here? I'd love to get your input. Yeah, you know, I think part of that question is sort of, can enterprises get there? Is there something to be had right now? And I think there's a general belief, um, you know, when you look at the neighborhood book club or something like that, that, that AI can do things, but enterprises are still very much on that journey of figuring out where to find that competitive advantage. I think in contrast to maybe the first era of AI where use cases were more restricted, we were really excited that deep learning models could help you identify what was in a picture. It could label that it's a cat sitting on a table, for example. A lot of enterprises had trouble figuring out how to just use image recognition and picture labeling in, in, in a way that was effective for their business. The transition now with generative AI is, is into much more macro topics like digital labor. You can you know, reinvent your business and its efficiency. You can give your procurement engineers superpowers and making much more intelligent decisions because they're able to access and handle much more data all at once and such like that. And so the transformative opportunity now is not just labeling, you know, cats sitting on tables in a garden, you know, in terms of that type of, you know, picture and deep learning image recognition or voice recognition or things like that. It's now the opportunity to change business processes. Um, and that goes all the way from things that you're doing on the cloud to things that you're doing in traditional transaction processing on a mainframe. So the other element is that this round of AI is much more pervasive about applications and opportunities throughout the IT landscape and throughout the overall functions of a business. Absolutely, and the big thing now that I think enterprises are trying to figure out is what do you run and where do you run this stuff? Yeah. So we, there was everybody was trying to build a chat GPT for the bank and chat GPT for the automobile industry. I heard this two years ago. And then I told them what it was going to cost to do that. And so we're going to have to come out to more tactical use cases for this. So now everybody's talking about smaller language models, agentic AI, as well as building LLMs. Mm -hmm. So the ability to make this stuff scale uh, becomes kind of a core capability. And the ability to put this on platforms is going to be more optimized for the use cases that you're moving after. Absolutely. So you guys have you know, the notion of hybrid by design, your ability to kind of leverage the platforms that are going to be aligned to the particular workloads uh, yeah. that you're using, that are aligned to the use cases. Tell me about that. How does that work? So in, in working with clients, I very much see what you're saying, which is that everyone is trying to get ROI out of AI, having now shown its ability to do something useful for the enterprise. And part of getting ROI is getting the cost under control. And we firmly believe that that means looking at AI as a conversation in its entirety across the full hybrid cloud landscape, across the full IT landscape. And I think hybrid cloud maybe begs defining, right? It, it's, it's good to define what we mean by that because we're not talking um, you know, only about having multiple cloud instantiations. We're talking about having similar and identical capabilities that you can choose where you deploy them. And that enables you to get into the workload placement conversation in a way that is conscious of data gravity. Where is the data? Well, that's maybe the cheapest place to bring the AI to. On the other hand, it's conscious of elasticity requirements. Um, maybe then you know, your AI-based workload should be in the cloud so we can instantaneously respond to when you're running a Super Bowl advertisement and need more capacity, right? And so there's, there's this optionality that hybrid cloud and hybrid cloud by design, which is the conversation about 
having consistency in platform capabilities, workload monitoring and observation, optimization of the IT and AI, being able to run in the public cloud, in multiple public clouds, on premises, on traditional IT, and maybe even out at the edge. So wherever your data is, your customers are, you want to have the optionality to match the AI to those things so that you can get the cost efficiency to be as good as possible and therefore have the ROI as, as high as possible. I, I love that. And I'm teaching a generative AI architecture course now. And one of the things my students and I are wrestling with is how to do the platform, make the platform decisions. And what I used to hear about in, in uh, early cloud computing days were, well, hey, Dave, what's the best cloud? Now I hear what's the best uh, AI platform. Yeah. And you get to this whole thing, it depends. It depends on the workload, what you're trying to solve, you're, you're, whether it's going to be a small language model, agentic based deployment, large language model deployment. You don't always need a GPU and certainly localization of these things. So how are you matching platforms to the workloads, to the AI workloads, and then match bringing that back into ROI? Because this is about optimization of the systems, you got to remember at the end of the day, everything works. Yeah. And so I can put this very small process on this very expensive platform and yeah. it's going to work just great. Yeah. It's going to run like crazy. But guess what? It's going to cost me a million dollars more a month than I should be paying. So there has to be some business consideration, this localization of the technology, your ability to understand the business outcomes of these systems. So how are you instructing people to pick platforms? Yeah, I always say hybrid by design is a conversation about optionality, right? Having the option to take your AI where you need to across that, that landscape. Um, it's a conversation about intentionality. So having the discussion about what are the overall factors and the cost of this deployment going to be? Is it going to be movement of data? Is it going to be um, throughput? Is it going to be that I am running the AI on, on as many credit card transactions that flow through the system as possible? Or is, or is there an implied cost to doing that at a lower rate and, and missing some potential fraud? So as you look at sort of that intentionality, the optionality to be across the estate, you mentioned cloud and cloud absolutely is a, is a primary place for AI these days. Um, but then, you know, choosing which cloud as relates to the rest of your data architecture and your workload architecture is an important variable that you want to have to be open um, because you likely are using multiple clouds. Our, our surveys of, of CIOs globally indicate um, that if you ask people, do they have a hybrid cloud, maybe not an intentional hybrid cloud architecture, but do they have a hybrid cloud, meaning are they using multiple clouds, it's over 80%, right? This is, this is everyone's reality now, um, which is having multiple cloud environments. But to flip to the opposite side of, of where you started, an example from the mainframe, our recent survey of IT leaders indicate that 78% are looking to deploy AI on the mainframe. Why? Well, important data our increased capabilities for AI optimization, AI acceleration in our current generation systems, and we've announced improved capabilities in our next generation processor and introducing an accelerator card we call Spire. And the reason for that really is to be able to say, can we in place do AI and machine learning technologies as critical things like credit card transactions or airline bookings or other things like that flow through the system in place rather than bouncing around to a complex architecture, some there, some in the cloud, et cetera, can we do it in place and get a lot of value in return from that AI? And I think that's a really great example of where making the decision to do it in place, bring the AI to the compute, bring the AI to the data, and having that optionality across the estate can really help lower the costs and improve the outcome because you're then watching everything real time as it flows through the system. Yeah, it's it's funny. I made a case for uh, leveraging the mainframe for AI-based systems, and people came up after they they they, they go that we thought that was legal, <laughs> and I said no, it's legal, and you can do it, and it, it makes a op it has a great opportunity for doing that because of the ability to bring the power you already have in your organization and match it to the workload models. And in some cases, that's going to be the most optimized way to do that. And you get yeah. to that discussion, that's a different level of play than everybody trying to throw you know, the new hyped platforms at the system versus leverage yeah. what you got, because uh, well, it's already invested. And, and it's not just mainframe, right? I mean, we're, we're working with a hospital in Asia Pacific, and they have a bunch of different data sets related to patient diagnostics on a power system. And then by integrating the speech to text work, um, the image recognition work, and the different elements of their overall workflow around diagnostics using the OnPower 10 AI accelerator, they've been able to go from a three day to a one day workflow, which as a patient concretely means getting my diagnosis in a day rather than waiting half the week or more, right? And so that's really just about them making a strategic platform decision of where to integrate things and where in the overall process things are going to be most efficient and most quickly done. And, and having that flexibility 
uh, whether it's on-prem, uh, on distributed infrastructure, on a power system, on a mainframe, or it's in different clouds where different elements of your workload are, I think are absolutely key, one of the key elements to, to making the whole AI process cost efficient. Absolutely. I'm going to rename my podcast to the Model of the Week podcast because every AI model is coming out. And I have to talk about it and uh, my clients are asking about it and it's becoming a bit nuts. You guys have your own model, Granite. Um, ultimately, how should enterprises consider the integration of AI models and what importance should it sh should be there and how should they make a decision as to which ones to run? Yeah, you know, with Granite, our focus really is in, in creating models uh, that have, I guess, a couple of critical dimensions. One of those is smaller models that can punch above their weight class, so to say, in terms of number of parameters, smaller number of parameters performing and giving the accuracy and, and results for an enterprise workflow of a model which might have many, many more parameters. Why is this important to this conversation? It's important because when people think about optionality across the estate, running on premises, running at the edge, other things like that, model size may be a consideration, right? Having a smaller model means throwing a little bit less hardware at it, running it more efficiently, having a cooler system, lower carbon footprint, other elements like that, right? And the second element is, is helping clients adapt those models for their customized purposes through, for example, our Instruct Lab technology. And we've been helping clients from an infrastructure perspective create on-premises environments to quickly create models using storage acceleration technology, using our storage appliances and our fusion family uh, to, to create models quickly and then to adapt and deploy them um, and deploy them efficiently. And I think that from this perspective, having models that have known data sources, we're very transparent on that. Uh, we provide indemnification, very, very critical uh, to enterprise value. And then we help our clients adapt those to their specific purposes to get a targeted outcome and then match infrastructure to that that enables them again across that IT landscape to get a great outcome. And so you can use the Granite model in public cloud, you know, from an API perspective, through a service, you can build around it. You can get an appliance on premises to use our models as well or you can just consume it as software and run it on hardware you've already got, right? And so again, that's the flexibility. Start with software and appliance, a cloud service, whatever you need to get to a cost optimized outcome, we're, we're trying to meet enterprises where they're at. I, I love that because you're talking about, this is about business optimization. And we, I think we missed that in lots of the other generation yeah. of technology. We, we didn't assign the business as a priority as a first class citizen in building these architectures. Yeah. And this is something I think we're, we're having to be pushed back to it now because now we're talking about building systems that are very costly to build and very costly to maintain, but they're also able to bring a lot of value yeah. uh, back to the business. So obviously multimodal technology, ability to leverage these kinds of, uh, th these kinds of systems and AI becomes very important. So how are you guys considering that as part of your infrastructure and what kind of questions are you getting from your clients around that? Yeah, you know, multimodal is is an interesting term. Maybe I should, should pause and define that a little bit. But but by that we mean you know a combination of different types of technologies. We also refer to ensemble AI, the ability to combine together machine learning and deep learning technologies with encoder models from from generative AI and and kind of bring everything together and sort of use the best fit for the particular thing that you're trying to solution. Um, ensemble AI and kind of com combining technologies has been a core focus of us and what we've been doing in our, our program for enabling integration of AI on the mainframe systems. Um, but I think overall, it's a, it's a much broader conversation as well about getting to that optimal outcome using a, a model that is small and efficient for the targeted purpose um, can help an enterprise get to that sort of value stream generation that you were bringing up much more quickly and providing that optionality um, to combine together the best of both worlds uh, is a way that we're seeing a lot of enterprises have success in getting through that that hurdle of, of, of closing the loop between the IT team, the software and application team, and then the overall you know, business owner that's looking for an outcome. So what advice would you give to the, I would say rank and file CIO, the person out there that's making their business work, the person that, you know, CIO can be a very tough position in many of these organizations that are looking at AI and considering all the options out yeah. there. What are, what are the things they should be considering now that are most important to you? Yeah, I mean, it, you, you threw out a couple of the words earlier that I love to gravitate to platform. I think there's a very significant platform conversation going on right now. Um, that has to do with optionality and, and ensuring that you have the ability to both oversee and optimize and manage and govern costs in a consistent way on this topic across different environments. 
I think there's a very significant optimization conversation. That means also workload optimization of your GPU farms that are handling your model build and deployment. For us, that's things like Turbonomic, for example, and Stana to have visibility on what's going on, Aptio to, to track costs and things like that. So those are all part of the hybrid by design and kind of platform conversation. But I think when it comes to this topic of AI, you know, one of my, um, I guess, uh, uh, several of the organizations that I really have a lot of respect for the velocity at which they're moving on these topics the CIO, the CDO, the chief AI officer, the you know, CAIO, whatever, whatever the titles are, and the risk and security teams are really functioning as a unit with a joint objective of getting AI deployed. And a lot of times that means in, in taking the workload decisions into account, it means taking into account things like security and compliance, data sovereignty, these other effects that might lead to an on-premises solution or might lead to a private cloud solution. Um, those conversations all happening in the open, I find, you know, and, and being solved as sort of a, a multi-factor consideration can lead organizations to a workload selection, you know, in terms of the deployment location, like we were talking about earlier, um, that enables you to get to a yes for moving from POC to production AI. And I think that's really what we are hoping to help bring together is that when those communities, the CIO, CTO, CAIO, chief risk officer, chief security officer, et cetera, when they all have different and seemingly competing uh, you know, uh, things that they're trying to solve in getting something deployed, we want to offer, again, that optionality across the hybrid cloud landscape so that things like risk, security, compliance, et cetera, can all be a yes as well um, and can help projects move to production as quickly as possible. That's great. And you're in the center of the universe at all, sitting here in IBM. And just I feel the innovation occurring around me. We're so, surrounded by clients here today. We're surrounded by clients here today. So <laughs> moving forward, this is probably one of the more important times that we're going to we're, we're going to experience in IT, IT evolution. You think about this in the last 35 years of my career. The next five years is going to be pinnacle to corporations be able to take themselves to the next level. And I think if they don't, they, many of them are going to cease to exist. They're not able to take, around, take the advantage of AI and therefore their clients are gonna come up and they're going to take the market share away from them right now. So I, I can't stress this enough. It's very important you get, you get literate in AI, you understand the moving parts. It's fairly complex, but it's fairly easy in many aspects of it. Find the partners, work with the technology vendors that are gonna provide the most value. That's how you win the war. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for this discussion today. You got it.